Cambridge GCSE Biology Major 2020 Paper 63. I'm sure all of you who have watched this video will do better in Paper 6, so let's get started. Question 1. A student investigated the effect of concentration on the rate of diffusion in model cells. Cubes of agar jelly containing universal indicator were used to represent the model cells. Part A. A student used a scalpel to cut four identical cubes from a large piece of agar. Each cube had the dimensions shown in figure 1.1. Each agar cube was green in color at the start of the investigation. Calculate the surface area in volume 4 of the cube shown in figure 1.1. To calculate the surface area, you find the area of one side of the cube first. It's 10 times 10, 100. Then there are six sides like this, so you multiply it by six again. It's 600 millimeters square. Then to find the volume, you multiply all these three numbers together. So it's 10 times 10 times 10 equals to 1000. Step 1. The student used the information in Table 1.1 to add the appropriate volumes of 1.0 mole per dm cube hydrochloric acid, HCl, and water to four test tubes labeled A, B, C, and D. Complete Table 1.1 by stating the unit for the final concentration of HCl. This is the concentration, and the unit for concentration is mole per dm cube. Calculating the missing concentration for test tube B, this is the missing part. Well, for test tube A, there was 5.0 cm3 of 1.0 mole per dm3 HCl. Then there was zero water. But then in B, it decreased by half to 2.5. And that 2.5 was put here, it just increased to 2.5, which means that the concentration will decrease by half again and become 0 0.5. Step 2. One green agar cube was put into each of test tubes A, B, C, and D. Step 3. A stop clock was started. Step 4. The student observed the color change in the agar cubes. The agar cubes changed color from green to red as shown in figure 1.2 in test tubes A, B, and C. So at first, everything was green. But as the green color started disappearing, okay, this diagram here does not mean that there are two cubes. It means that the outer surface is red, but the inner part is green. So you can kind of imagine the green color fading away on its surface and becoming red, but the center part still in green. Okay, and the end point is when the whole thing became red. Step 5. After 6 minutes, the agar cube in test tube D had not changed color. The student stopped observing the agar cubes and stopped the stop clock. The times taken for the agar cubes in test tubes A, B, and C to change color and the time at which the student stopped the stop clock in step 5 are shown in figure 1.3. They always show it in stopwatch, so 55 seconds, 2 minutes 5 seconds, 4 minutes 25 seconds, and this one was 6 minutes 16 seconds. Convert the times in figure 1.3 to seconds. Prepare a table and record this result. If the time taken is greater than 6 minutes, record the time as greater than 360 for that cube. Let's first change these to seconds, 55, then 2 minutes 5 seconds is 2 times 60 plus 5, 1, 2, 5, 4 times 60 plus 25, 2, 6, 5. Then this is just over 6 minutes, so you just have to write like this. Okay, and when we draw the table, they said put the results into the table. And these results are basically about the test tubes and the time taken. So you'll need one column for the test tubes and the second column for the time taken in seconds. This is the complete diagram. It's not hard to draw, you just have to identify what information you're supposed to put in your table. State the conclusion for these results. Well, to state the conclusion, we first have to go back and remind ourselves what this test tube stands for. So test tube A had the highest concentration. It was 1.0. Then as it went down, the concentration decreased until it became 0.0. .0. 
So going back to the table, we can see that test tube A took the shortest time and test tube D took the longest time. This means that higher the concentration, the faster it diffuses or it just takes the shortest time. Describe the purpose of test tube D. Well, test tube D took more than 6 minutes and the concentration of it was zero. So this was just to see if having no hydrochloric acid at all will cause a color change. So we're just trying to see if water alone can cause the color change. Identify one safety hazard when carrying out this investigation and describe how the risk of this hazard could be reduced. There are two possible answers for this. The first one is that, you know, you're cutting the cubes. And according to the mark scheme, it's very dangerous. And of course, it's dangerous because it's sharp, you're using a knife. So the precaution is you just cut it away from your hand or fingers. The second possible answer is that we are using an acid, which is hydrochloric acid. And we have to be careful when using an acid. You have to wear gloves or an eye protection because it's corrosive. Part B, a student calculated the rate of diffusion of acid into an agar cube. The student observed that the acid traveled 2 millimeters in 120 seconds. Suggest so how the student could calculate the rate of diffusion. Well, rate is always something divided by time. In this case, it will be the distance travel, which is 2 millimeters. So you can either write just divide 2 by 120, or you can elaborate and write distance travel divided by time taken. Plan an experiment to investigate the relationship between the size of the agar cubes and the time taken for the agar to change color. Well, we've just done a similar experiment from the previous questions using the agar cubes. So it's going to be pretty similar. And we just have to change that we're deferring the size of the agar cubes instead of the concentration of an acid. But we're still following the same structure. So follow the format, we first start with the methods. Similarly, we're going to use scalpel to cut cubes to different sizes. Then we need to place these cubes into an acid just like we did. You can just write hydrochloric acid. Okay, then start timing when it's placed into an acid and stop timing when the end point is reached. So the end point is when you see a color change. Then it's time to state how we're going to control the independent variable. Independent variable is something that we can change which is the size in this case. Use at least three different size cubes, for example, 100 millimeter cube, 500 millimeter cube, and 1000 millimeter cube. Now we have to write about the variables that need to be kept constant. Firstly, it's a diffusion and diffusions affected by the temperature. So keep the temperature constant, maybe by using a thermostatically controlled water bath. While using this thermostatically controlled water bath is in almost every question, so maybe in your exam, you can write this point if you see that there is a connection with the temperature. Then of course, the acid that you're going to use should be of same concentration and volume, and also the type of agar cubes that you're using should be the same. One last point is that the shape of agar cubes should be the same as well, because if some of them are cubes and some of them are spheres, they're obviously going to have different results. Then the dependent variable is the time taken for the agar to change color. Well, usually when these agar cubes are used to test the diffusion, they're usually pink. So you can mention that time taken for cube to become completely pink should be taken. Finally, the ways to improve the experiment. Of course, we have to repeat the investigation at least two more times. 
And then some relevant safety precautions. Well, like I just mentioned, we have used acid. So write that since you're using an acid, use safety goggles or wear gloves. I think some of you would have noticed that these two answers are in most of the questions. So what you can do is just write these two points in your actual exam. Then you can, you know, at least secure two marks from this. But it's not guaranteed that these two will be in the mark scheme of your next paper. But you know, there's a high chance that it will be. So it's a tip. Okay, and just to let you know, you're not supposed to write this whole thing to get a full mark. Actually, I've written more than enough points. So the maximum mark you can get from writing the method is 2. For independent variable, it's 1. Constant variables, it's 2. Dependent variables, it's 1 mark. So you can see that it all adds up to 8 marks. So I would say that they're not very strict on it. Also, you have so many options for the constant variables. So you can always get a full mark for this question. So just try as many questions related to this. Memorize all the tests and the results. Then you'll do well in your exam. Question 2, part A. Figure 2.1 shows the comparison of the nutrient content of beans and nuts. A student was given a sample of food and wanted to know if it was from a bean or a nut. The student decided to test for the presence of two of the substances listed in figure 2.1. The results of the test would enable the student to determine if the food sample was from a bean or a nut. Complete table 2.1 by stating which two substances in figure 2.1 will enable the student to determine if the food sample is from a bean or a nut. Okay, don't worry, you're not supposed to know how to differentiate a bean and a nut. So all you have to do is just compare the nutrient facts given here. Beans contain zero fat, but nuts have 54 grams of fat. And nuts contain zero vitamin C, but beans contain 15 milligrams of vitamin C. Which means that you can differentiate these two by comparing the fat and the vitamin C. And that's our answer. The food test that would be used to identify each substance. Yes, you are supposed to know all the food tests. So, for fats, we have to use the emulsion test, and for vitamin C, we have to use the CPIP test. If you haven't heard about this test before, please go ahead and Google it or find it on YouTube and watch it. You have to know what these are and their procedures and results. Next, the positive result for each food test. For the emulsion test, if the fat is present, it will turn cloudy or white. Then for the CPIP test, from blue, it's going to change to colorless. Part B, figure 2.2 shows the caterpillar of a coddling moth. The coddling moth damages walnut trees and reduces the yield of the walnut crop. Okay, ew, no offense. Anyway, to reduce the damage to a walnut crop, scientists released wasps that can kill the coddling moth caterpillars. Wasps are flying insects. They look like bees. The effect of releasing different numbers of wasps on the damage to a walnut crop was investigated. The results are shown in Table 2.2. Well, as they increased the number of wasps released, the percentage damage decreased, which shows us that the more wasps there are out there, the less damage it is to the walnut crop. Plot a line graph on the grid of the data in Table 2.2. So first, we have to decide what's going to be on the x-axis and what's going to be on the y-axis. x-axis is the independent variable which is controlled by us. We're controlling the number of wasps. So this will be the x-axis and percentage damage will be the y-axis. So for x-axis, it's from 0, 0.0 to 4.0. And there are 1, 2, 3, 4.5 big boxes. Then we can allocate one big box as 1.0 so that our range is from 0 to 4.5 this is our x-axis and y-axis has 1 2 3 4.5 big boxes and the range is from 1.2 to 4.0 then again this can also have one big box as 1.0 now it's complete so plot the points and draw the graph Describe the pattern shown by the data on your graph.
it's first decreasing downwards then it levels off meaning there is hardly any change in the percentage damage well when they ask you to describe a data on your graph it's always good to quote a figure from the data so we can say that the graph levels off at 1.8 times 10 to the power of 5 per hectare Suggest so a number of walls that should be released into one hectare of walnut trees. State the evidence from your graph that supports your choice. We know that the more number of wasps we add, the less the percentage damage. But we have found out that from this point, which is 1.8 times 10 to the power of 5 per hectare, there is hardly any change in the percentage damage. So this is actually the limit and even if you add more of this, there will be still similar percentage damage. So the answer is just add 1.8 times 10 to the power of 5 wasps because there will be no further benefit after this point or just no increased yield from adding more wasps. Suggest so one way the investigation could be modified to give a more accurate estimate of the optimum or best number of wasps to release into a walnut crop. The way we do this is to have more intermediate values, meaning that since in our graph, well, we have a big gap between 0.9 and 1.8. So instead of jumping straight to 1.8, we can add more values in between such as 1.1, 1.5, 1.7, etc. So add more intermediate values. Part C, figure 2.3 shows a photograph of a walnut tree leaf. Make a large drawing of the leaf shown in figure 2.3. Well, if you have watched my paper 61 and 62 videos, you already know the rules but I'll just state them again. Firstly, everything should be a single smooth line. So no double lines like this, this is definitely wrong. And next, the size, it should occupy at least three quarters of the space given. Usually a large space is given, so you have to make it big enough to fill up the space. Then the proportion or the detail should be accurate. If this part is small, then draw it small or thin and you see some details here, you have to draw these lines as well. And lastly, never shade your drawing. Okay, this diagram does look dark and you feel like you have to shade it but never do that. You will lose marks if you do that. This is my drawing. It's big enough and I have a lot of details. I've drawn all the veins. There are at least 10 veins on each side of the leaf. Also, I have drawn this part as an added detail so it's here they're branched and my drawing is not shaded so it's complete measure the length of line pq on figure 2.3 include the unit length of line pq on figure 2.3 it's easy just use your ruler to measure this line it should be around 50 millimeters don't forget that the units for these lines are in millimeters Calculate the actual width of the leaf on figure 2.3 using the formula and your measurement. Magnification equals to length of line PQ on figure 2.3 over actual width of the leaf. So we need to find the actual width and the length of line PQ on figure 2.3 we've just found it as 50 millimeters than the magnification. I wonder if you guys would have noticed this but there's magnification written here 0.5. So just substitute the values to find the actual width of the leaf. The answer is 100 millimeters. That's the end of this paper. Tell me how you found this paper and my video. Your comments make my day. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to get ready for your IGCSE exams. And like and share my videos if it helped you. Stay safe and God bless you guys. Bye.